Hello, my name is Anthony Smith and I'm Chief Executive of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. We are the UK's democracy support organisation, working with political parties, parliaments, electoral bodies and civil society in countries around the world. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. The purpose of the event is to mark the launch of a policy paper on the relevance of democracy to the UK's international strategy. That strategy has been developed through an integrated review of the UK's foreign security, defense and development policies. And the review was launched by the Prime Minister at the beginning of this year, paused at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and restarted a few weeks ago. And we hope that this event and the paper will make a useful contribution to the review. The paper is now available on the WFD website and Alex's opinion piece in the Times newspaper yesterday set out the main arguments. So let me introduce our two panelists. Sue English is chair of the Board of Trustees of the Disasters Emergency Committee, vice chair of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, and deputy chair of the Board of Trustees of Reach South, a multi-academy trust. Sue was head of political programs for BBC News for 10 years until 2015, responsible for the BBC's political, parliamentary and election news. And earlier in her career, she was senior foreign editor and deputy editor of Channel 4 News. More recently, she chaired the board of the International News Safety Institute, a charity that works for the safety of journalists around the world. Alex there is Dem Senior Democracy Fellow at Freedom House and Senior Advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. He previously served as Executive Director of the Overseas Development Institute in London, and his career has long been at the intersection between democracy, rights, and development. And I first met Alex when he was a senior official at USAID, appointed by President Obama, and I was working at the UK Department for International Development. And we were struggling together with how to make development cooperation more effective, especially more locally owned. And our mutual desire to push donors harder to be better partners drove us to continue collaborating when Alex moved to London to take up the position at ODI. And I had moved to WFD. And the policy paper we're launching today is the culmination of that long collaboration. So the format of this one hour event is simple. Sue will be interviewing Alex for about 40 minutes and will then turn to questions from the audience. We receive some questions by email in advance, but you can also submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So over to you, Sue. Thank you, Anthony, and good afternoon, everyone. Alex, this is a fascinating paper and uh, it gives us an awful lot of things to discuss over the next hour. Um, let's kick off by just starting with this very bleak picture that you paint of the current state of democracy around the world. Give us your view of what's going on and why it matters. Thanks, Sue. And let me start by thanking you and Anthony and the WFD team uh, they've been tremendous to work with, and so many who uh, generously contributed their thoughts to, to making this, this work possible. And I also want to start by acknowledging those who are struggling on the front lines of democratic change. Uh, as your own work suggests, Sue, it's been a very dangerous time for journalists, protesters, civil society activists, uh, sadly, even in our own countries. Um, and I think that it's, it's really critical to acknowledge that. Um, we're in a mess at the moment, uh, but that has been happening for some time. Um, we learned this year, um, we passed a dark threshold that for the first time since the year 2000, the majority of the countries in the world and the majority of the people in the world are no longer free. Uh, living in nations that enjoy robust democracy. And we have faced now about 15 years of aggregate democratic declines around the world. And that is in established democracies, in struggling democracies, and even in authoritarian countries. And, you know, to be clear for the audience, we're not just talking about Venezuela and, and Burma, although those are tragic situations. Uh, these are declines in the US, the UK, the EU. Um, Freedom House in 2020 published a report calling uh, it the leaderless struggle uh, for democracy. 
And of course, there are many good stories out there. Um, and last year before the pandemic, uh, there were protests around the world, um, hopeful stories. Uh, but at the moment, we really have a very dangerous, simultaneous squeeze happening. We have the weakening of democracy in some of the stalwart countries. Uh, we have a, a very scary rise of authoritarians and authoritarianism that are using the tools of digitalization and finance, effectively weaponizing this system that has been created uh, against uh, democracies themselves. And you see this in Russian election interference in the US and the UK, what's happening now in Hong Kong, which I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, and you have all these countries that are in the middle that are struggling to become democratic. Um, they face enormous challenges of, of inequality and economic change and, and automation. Um, but at the same time, they're getting often free technologies helping them to suppress their populations um, and learning tools of the trade from authoritarians. And finally, of course, we have this awful pandemic, um, which is not only a tragedy for human health, uh, but is also accelerating negative trends around the world that are that are crushing uh, freedom and and democracy. And you know, in my opinion, the UK does not have the option to stand on the sideline uh, to eke out a narrow set of interests. Uh, it has to stand up boldly and confront these challenges. Fascinating, and I think we'll come back, no doubt, to the pandemic and the effects at a, at a later point in the discussion. I mean, just going back a bit, I remember when I was at Channel 4 News in the late 80s covering the fall of communism and this huge wave of optimism that followed that. Um, and, you know, you look around the world now and you read the, your paper and you do wonder, you know, where did it all go wrong? And have we effectively passed the point at which we could have seen the, 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 the growth of democratic government around the world? Was it just a blip and we're back to a kind of an authoritarian way of living? Or is there actually something that we really can do to change the course? Yeah, well, I think that's the very question we have to wrestle with. I think like you, I, I remember uh, 30 years ago, I would take the audience back to that time at the end of the Cold War. Um, I was a young research assistant in a Soviet studies institute. And I can remember running uh, from a sort of computer telex thing that we had to the printer, to the copy machine, to spread the news on an almost daily basis about these incredible things that were happening with the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, and, you know, the subsequent 30 years have been remarkable in so many ways. If you look at the reduction of extreme poverty, for example, um, it has been a tremendous period, but of course, one of the most remarkable was the expansion of democracy um, and this idea of open societies, that basic freedoms were for everyone, no matter where you were, how, what wealth you had, what cultural background you came from, your history, um, that, that rule of law, human and civil rights were, were prevailing. Um, and we got this idea that democracy wasn't just for rich nations or certain cultures, and that was being debunked around the world. And I, and I think that nations, uh, the UK and nations like it, prospered enormously from these changes. Um, the gaining of allies, the safety um, and, and freedom, the ability to deal with like-minded countries to resolve and deal with the big challenges that we face together in the world. Of course, opening of markets, um, all of these things, explosion of independent media, the creation of this incredible landscape of internet and and all of these systems. Um, but, but as you say, history did not end. Um, and many of the changes that we saw were fragile. Um, and many of them were unwanted by leaders whose control of resources and people were threatened by these changes. Um, and the empire strikes back. Uh, we see that authoritarians learned from the color revolutions, learned from the opening of the internet, the ways to control those things, the ways to tamp down, and, and became not only satisfied with the suppression of their own people, but I think became engaged in, in this very Putinist project of believing that undermining democracy and alliances around the world was also to their benefit. So, given all those things, what is it that you're actually suggesting that 
should, which we should do, the UK should be in the forefront of doing, but that will actually be effective in rolling back some of these uh, movements to, away from democracy and towards authoritarianism? Well, in one way, I think that the report really says three things. First of all, this is incredibly important to the UK, and the UK should seize this moment for leadership. Um, the second is that in order to do that, the UK needs to place these democratic principles and values at the heart of its strategy uh, uh, on foreign policy, national security policy, and, and international development. Uh, but that's not easy. Uh, it means that you really have to create a lens that you see your decisions through the ways in which these changes can happen and sometimes make hard choices to do things that don't always benefit the short term. Um, and the third is that you need an integrated strategy. You can't just say, well, let's do this, but we're also doing 50 other things. You really need to have a, a coherent uh, focus. And so I think that the more detailed recommendations um, kind of also recommend then three things. Um, the first is really about the values. Uh, the UK needs to develop a principled approach to multilateralism. It can't just be out in the world uh, making allies for this and that. It really needs to think about the ways in which a multilateral strategy um, is going to benefit these interests in the long term. Uh, but it also really needs to focus on inclusion. Um, and that's a message for home as well as for international policy. Genuine democracy really requires inclusion. And part of what we're seeing with this tremendous movement of global anti-racism around the world um, is that we have all failed fully to realize the benefits of democracy and equality at home. And if you embed that in the way you do business, who you hire, the way that you think about issues, um, it's also going to be critical for the way that you do those things uh, abroad. Um, the second one uh, that I know that I think we'll come back to, but this idea of creating an integrated strategy means that you have to be thinking about different countries and where they're at. Um, and so this idea of defending established uh, democracies and institutions, supporting emerging and struggling democracies, and countering authoritarians, that this strategy, I think, has to be created uh, that way. And then the final, of course, is like with any strategy, it comes down to organization, people, and resources. Um, and particularly at a moment when the government is creating this new Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, merging the FCO and DFID, it's going to be very important to get this right. And so one of the things I recommend is creating a department for democratic governance so that it can bring these disparate elements of the work. It's not just about development. It's not just diplomacy. It's not just security. There needs to be a place where these things are actually brought together in a, in a coherent fashion. Yeah, there's an awful lot to unpack in that. Um, let's start off with this issue about uh, our approach to multilateralism. Just give us a kind of concrete example of how you would see the UK developing its multilateral uh, connections in the next year or so when we are, you know, to paraphrase Dean Acheson, we're still desperately trying to find our role in the world. Um, and there are complications around our relationships with countries like China, uh, and Russia, um, and all the kind of trade negotiations that are going on at the same time. So what would your kind of guiding principle be for people who are trying to develop that strategy of multilateralism? Well, one thing I would say is that I think you find your way by walking the path. Uh, they're, they're, you're not going to get this right kind of whole and then proceed on it. Um, and I think that there have been a couple of interesting signs just in the last few weeks that, that, that provide some guidance for that. I mean, you know, China, for example, has been putting enormous pressure in forums like the UN and the World Intellectual Property Organization and others to look at things like internet sovereignty, to break up the internet so that they can control their piece of it. Um, things that ultimately will be about suppressing speech and, uh, and, and, and issues related to privacy and surveillance. Um, I think it's great that the UK is pushing back on this. I think that the decision to look closely at technological issues, 
um, like the 5G decision um, and, and UK participation in setting up a, a technological framework for the future um, and doing that together with a set of allies and, and, and multilateralism takes place in, in different places, right? There's the, there's the formal forums like in the UN and the World Bank and IMF, other places where it's critical that they are using their voice, but they can also be, as, as a critical player, they can also help to set up sort of groupings that will work on specific issues um, to make change. Uh, you know, this is a little bit of an older example, but in 2013, uh, the Commonwealth revised its uh, principles and put democracy right at the top. Um, I think that is the type of work that the UK needs to be doing in order not to only use multilateralism to further its interests, but actually to have a principled multilateralism that uses those tools and institutions to further objectives that are in line with these values. How would you convince somebody who looked at this debate and said, yeah, okay, you know, democracy is important, but listen, what's really important to us at the moment is that we get our economy back on track, that we find what our, um, the way that we're going to operate in this post-Brexit world. You know, it's not in our national interest to pursue this. How would you answer that? Well, I think there's a couple of ways because it's an important question. And the first is a call to modesty, right? But we've all got problems. We are all struggling. And it's not a time to believe that suddenly declaration of a strategy is going to, is going to change these problems. But I also believe that this is not nice to have. This is must have uh, for the UK. Um, you know, I worry that the UK might be the, the frog on the, on the boil as it were, um, and uh, that issues like the murder of Jamal Khashoggi or, or the attack on Scripple, these things, if they are not responded to vigorously or some of the bigger trends that we're talking about, it risks the UK finding itself in a world that is, is not just supportive it wants to do, but inimical to its values. And, and if you look at what's happening in Brazil and India, even the US with a, a, a tweet from Donald Trump this morning threatening to postpone the US election, something that wasn't even done during our, our civil war. Um, you know, if you had some very big allies, some very big nations that help to carry the banner that are, that are tent poles falling, that would be very dangerous um, for the UK. And I, and I think what we need to be fixated on now is that, you know, we want to, at, in this moment of crisis, we want to come out with a system that looks more like 1946 than 1918. Um, and it's looking a lot like 1918 at the moment. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the critical lesson of this time, which we've been talking about, is that you can go backwards. Things don't always move forward. Um, I was I, I saw a quote, uh, we lost a great civil rights leader, John Lewis, this week in, in the US. And I saw a quote from him uh, just the other day saying that the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change that we have in a democratic society. And we must use it not because it's guaranteed, but because you can lose it. And that idea of people who have fought and won these great struggles that you can go backward um, should be fundamental for the way that the UK is looking at its future right now. So that's a really interesting point, Alex, because obviously, as you know, we've recently had this very critical report um, from the Select Committee, the Intelligence Select Committee, which has kind of shone a quite uh, unwelcome, well, welcome, but, you know, unbecoming light, if you like, on, on the strength of our electoral system here. Um, I think a lot of people would feel looking at the last, you know, four or five years, particularly around the EU referendum and, and subsequent events, that our democracy isn't, is looking a little bit battered. And I do wonder to what extent uh, the UK would be taken seriously by the rest of the world, you know, going around trumpeting about the importance of democracy when, you know, we're not looking too, too good in our own backyard. I mean, how, do you, how would you answer that? Yeah, well, it, it is definitely a walk the walk moment. Um, it, if we ever had credibility in espousing the virtues of democracy to others, um, it always stood on the work that we do at home. It stood on the civil rights movements and, 
and uh, the things that have come before and after for women's rights, for LGBTQ rights, um, the things that we do for transparency. Uh, you know, I often work in countries uh, where there are challenges with corruption. And I say to people, we have corruption uh, in our countries, uh, but we punish it. Um, uh, and the difference has to be that you are seen as credible in what you do. Um, and so that means that the, the UK has to be very, very attentive right now to walking the walk. Um, we are fair, facing the same questions in the US right now. Um, but I am also not one of those who says that, you know, we should give up on it because we're not doing well here. I think that these things are interrelated. If we don't feel, you know, now how interrelated everything that we do is between climate and pandemics and, and all of these other things, we're never gonna get it that um, what we do affects each other. Um, and I do believe that working on these issues abroad will also help us uh, to be better at them at home. Yeah. Just looking back again at the question about elections and the strength of our electoral systems, what exactly would you see the UK uh, being able to do if it was putting the strengthening democracy at the core of its foreign policy? What would you expect it to do about elections that are taking place around the world, which are kind of hollowed out elections? You know, they look like they're elections, but actually there are all sorts of issues around them, which mean that they're not really democratic. The conflation of elections with democracy in many ways is a real problem for all of us who work on these issues because elections are the icing on the cake. That's the thing that helps you make the change. But it is the institutions, it's the independent judiciary that makes it so that if there's a problem in the elections, there can be a, a decision that's accepted by all or an elections commission. There have to be political parties that that respect the rule of law and that are not illiberal democracies, uh, like uh, the leaders in Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, like to say. They actually have to respect not only the outcome of elections themselves, but also the rights of all citizens, uh, regardless of whether they are in the majority. And of course, uh, media is absolutely fundamental. Independent media um, has to be there, it has to be holding everyone's feet to the fire. Elections are an accountability mechanism, but they only work to achieve accountability if people know the truth of what their elected leaders have delivered or, or failed to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the last piece, which is you know, not totally new, but it's a bit of a new one, is that you know, these, these, these questions of interference, of cyber attacks, of disinformation, are shaking citizen confidence in elections because they don't know what's real. And so when someone stands up and say there's been interference or there's going to be interference or something happened, when it becomes harder for citizens to know what is true and what is not true and easier for demagogues to, to tell lies that get to everyone, uh, then we are all in trouble. And that's also not to speak of the actual very real possibility of cyber hacking of election systems as they become more electronic. All of those things contribute to a level of distrust and we have to build to restore that trust in our own systems and help others around the world to, to be able to do the same. It's hard, grimy, detailed work, uh, but, but it, it needs to be heavily supported. Going, going back to the issue of independent media, I mean, you actually say in your uh, report that you think there's an extinction level threat to independent media. It kind of sounds a bit melodramatic. What, what do you mean by that? And give us an example of the kind of things you're thinking of. Well, it came from someone affiliated with the BBC. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, it was a great quote in one of our discussions. And, and I think that, that it's, coming from, it's coming from two things, right? There has been this long downward slope, negative pressure on independent media because of the business model, because of authoritarians, um, downward pressures on the amount of local reporting, on investigative journalism, on consolidation of media outlets. These are all multi-year, multi-decade trends that have put downward pressure and consolidation of all of the revenue and so on into a few large internet platforms. Um, but then the pandemic has really dealt a very serious blow. 
both because authoritarians has used this as a way to control media and to suppress media, to give themselves emergency powers in dangerous ways, but also because the revenue's not there. I mean, you can't, you can't sell physical newspapers um, because no one's out buying things. Of course, you can do it online, but, but that has still been challenging. And so there's just a lot of market implications right now that are also having a negative effect. And when you bring all of that together, um, I think we are seeing something that looks like a potential extinction level event around the world of good on the ground investigative reporting that ultimately matters to citizens' ability to exercise their rights and freedoms. One of the other things that you pick up on, in particular in the issue of supporting sort of emerging and struggling democracies, the, the democracies that you're talking about sort of in the middle, um, is the whole issue about, um, uh, uh, you know, reversing the trend. And one of the questions I suppose I would ask you is, do you think that there is a role here? for the UK in helping those democracies? Or, you know, are we, should we be focusing more on our own, cleaning up our own act and or, you know, countering the authoritarian side of, uh, of, 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 the, of the world? Well, I am a very, very strong believer um, in the power of DFID or what it may become uh, in the power of foreign assistance um, in the incredible influence um, that uh, DFID has had. The 0.7 commitment, which uh, still stands, um, does in many ways make the UK uh, development superpower. And I, and I do hope that this new entity that's created from the merger of the Foreign Office and DFID is going to continue in this strong tradition. But one of the very important things um, that DFID has done as to invest in this idea of good governance, of thinking not only about investing directly in development, you know, helping people to get enough food and vaccines and so on, but really taking a systems level look at what brings change, what brings sustainable change. Um, and I think what we all know coming out of a lot of study over years is that, that governance and politics really matter. Um, it is ultimately citizen accountability, holding the state accountable, the social contract, taxation that leads to citizen demand for better services, that leads to more accountability, effective parliamentary inquiry, all of those things together, that's really what democracy is about. And those are things that development can and should support. And so what I'm advocating is that, 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 that the UK step up even further and that it see that, that really a lot of its best work has actually come from supporting these pillars of democracy and it should do so because in the long term, that's really what helps societies to change. When the people own their own agenda, when citizens are empowered, that is when we see the longest and strongest inclusion, economic growth, exertion of rights and freedoms. And that's what we want for everyone. And if we think that that is ultimately what carries things the furthest, then that is in part what we should be investing in. And this argument is making, this, this report is making a strong argument, in fact, that, that, that the UK should be thinking about doing development democratically and that it should put these ideas and principles at the core of its approach to development. So you were obviously writing your report when the news was uh, released that uh, the government was planning to fold DFID into the Foreign Office. What, what did, did that make you think and how did you change your report or add to your report in order to reflect that difference? Because I think a lot of people in the sector feel that that is um, a backward step, if you like, for the, the role of Britain as, as you would describe it, as a development superpower. I think a lot of people have seen that as a very negative thing. Well, I, I wrote critically in advance of the decision about the potential decision because I think we have looked at the impact of these mergers uh, around the world and other places where they've happened. And they often aren't conducive to making sure that the development voice is at the table, that the priorities of citizen rights and 
poverty reduction are at the center of thinking um, when it is often really the, the foreign office that is, is in charge. I also make a very practical point, which is that, you know, it's not easy to design and program 13 plus billion pounds well a year. And uh, the parliament and the government and particularly the British public are very fixated on the need for value for money, that those investments need to be good investments and they need to get what you're paying for um, in doing so. And, and so I think that there is a danger that a department that is not used to uh, it, carrying out, implementing uh, very large scale programming, uh, that they stumble, that they, that they don't figure out how to do that effectively. Um, and that can be a deficit. And I know that the Independent Commission on Aid Review, ICAI, has looked at comparatively DFID and FCO programs and frankly, pretty much across the board has often found that those FCO programs are not as strong with, with some important exceptions. I think particularly on some of the issues that we're talking about, like support for democracy and elections. Um, but, but the reality is, is that if this is going forward, we have to look for the opportunity that exists. And I do think there is actually a really important opportunity. Um, currently, support for the sorts of things that we're talking about, democracy, independent media, it's very divided around the government. Some of it's in DFID, some of it's in the FCO, some of it's in joint funds, some of it's outside of these entirely. And the opportunity to rethink how you do this work well, how you make sure that UK national interests um, are at the heart of the thinking, but that those interests are concomitant with the interests of democracy and rights and freedom around the world, it, it is an important opportunity to create coherence and to perhaps strengthen those programs. Uh, and so we recommend this idea of creating a department within the, the, the new um, department, maybe that's the wrong word, um, uh, to ensure that there is leadership, that there are resources, and that, that there is a coherent policy and approach and strategy. So one of the things that you talk about in, in, in when you're trying when you're putting the argument that Britain that the UK should um, play a key role in this is that the, that we still have um, what you describe as global engagement capacity and reach. Do you really think that the UK these days is seen by the rest of the world as uh, as a player in the international in international affairs, or do you feel? that you know this is a this is a kind of you know country withdrawing if you like from the role that it's had in the past in 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 the role of in, in the world of international affairs well I, I think that the uk is at exactly the crossroads you describe and i think that there has been a great and interesting struggle or debate uh, since the brexit vote um, about what that means and is it a is it a drawing back? Is it uh, a smaller worldview, um, an inward worldview? Or is there truly something to this global Britain idea um, that the UK uh, still, in some ways, has the ability to punch above its weight and to have influence around the world? And, you know, I think this debate will go on for some time, but I certainly believe that if it chooses its path and battles well, the UK has an enormous opportunity for ongoing influence. First of all, we are in what feels like a leaderless world. So there are opportunities to step up. As, uh, as we talked about before, the UK is doing uh, in some ways on issues like Hong Kong, on uh, broadly on, on issues around China um, and uh, 5G. Um, it can do these and, and it can be successful and it can bring others along with it by virtue of the fact that it still is a very credible voice around the world on a lot of these issues. It has a lot of resources to bear and the world is looking for for, for leadership, and I don't mean that in the sense that the UK will lead the world, but I do mean it in the sense that if there are succinct 
issues that the UK can really grab onto and say, we are going to lead on making sure that independent media, freedom of speech, protection of journalists, those sorts of issues, the ones that we talked about on elections, that those are a priority for us as a society, for the world in general, and we are going to fight for them, um, then yes, I, I think they can. But you know, I learned something in government. I worked for the US government for six years. And you know, often these things come down to when the, a minister or an ambassador goes into a meeting and they've got a list of talking points in front of them, you know, is, is rights and democracy one, two, three, or not on the list at all? Will they get to it if it's at the bottom or are they not even bringing it up? And it's often really about elevating those issues even when the conversation is difficult. And do you, looking from the outside at British politics at the moment, do you think there's a political will here to put democracy that high up on their list of asks? Well, um, I don't know. Um, I, it, we heard mixed things. We talked to a number of really interesting uh, people, uh, former prime ministers you see in the report, others, and uh, people from parliament, uh, people from inside the government, experts from outside. And, and to be honest, we got a very mixed view on exactly that question, Sue, because some people believe um, it is time for that change and focus and that it, it is a return to a core set of British values that are also global values. Um, and others believe that, that the UK is at the moment too mired in other sort of narrower pursuits and won't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the good side of that answer is that there's something to fight for, right? I'm sure that I'm often uh, speaking to the choir, the people on this call, but if you are energized by this issue, if you think that this is the type of change that the UK should see, it is an opportunity and a moment for potential influence. I also think that not only is this review going on, which makes it important and rethinking the new, uh, the new department, but it, the UK has also been rocked, as you said, by the imperiling of rights of British nationals in Hong Kong, by the revelation of horrendous gulags uh, in China, by other abuses around the world, um, by Russian interference in elections. Um, all of these things have to make you think, if we're not doing something about this now, then when, when are we going to? Mm -hmm. So that just brings me on to the last question that I want to ask you, and then we'll move on to some questions that have come in from people who are listening. Um, you were writing this at a time when we were dealing with, and still are dealing with, a pandemic which has changed our views of virtually every element of our lives and, uh, you know, of our, our country. How did it affect what you, uh, what you eventually came up with in terms of recommendations? Did you look at it and think, actually, this does change the way that we need to deal with, um, with issues around democracy? Yeah, I, I, and I think it's profound in a couple of ways, uh, and ways, of course, that we don't even fully understand. Um, the first, of course, is this issue of acceleration. Um, the, the time frame for needing to pay attention to the ways in which the world is changing rapidly, in part pressed by all of the dynamics of this pandemic, are very real. Um, and so I think it increases a, a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is really about this idea that, you know, the pandemic has caused all nations to turn inward um, and, and probably will do for some time because we are struggling. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those things that points out the solidarity factor and how we are all in this together. And I think what it makes me feel is that um, we need to be paying attention to those who are struggling um, on the front lines. Uh, this is not something that's going to play out on the global stage necessarily. It's something that's going to play out in country after country. Um, you know, I really love this idea of kind of mutual support movements that have sprung up, particularly during the pandemic. People really getting out to help those in their communities or others that they see struggling. 
Um, and I do think it's a, a moment of, of global solidarity in that sense and, and finding ways to, to help others. And I think the third is that, you know, one of the things that the pandemic has revealed, of course, is that public spending is critical to address crises. Um, and that we can quibble in the best of times over what we spend, but recognizing when something is fundamentally changing that you have to deal with it. And that comes not only for the emergency of the pandemic, but I actually believe it's a really important time to step back and to think about, okay, are we, are we really getting the big picture here of the ways in which the world can change? And I think the recommendations in this report, they're not aid recommendations. They're not just about what development actors should be thinking about. This is what people should be thinking about across foreign policy, security, media, all law enforcement, all of these communities. Um, this is a big issue that is going to affect our societies, I think, for years, if not decades to come. Um, and we've got to be dealing with it now. That's really fascinating. I'm going to take a couple of questions that we've had in from people um, who are, are taking part in the webinar. One of them, which I think we sort of half touched on, is the issue of cybersecurity. Um, and it comes from somebody whose business is cybersecurity. Um, and they're asking that um, you know, they're saying it's a funda fundamental element for protecting democratic values, but how do you see cybersecurity fitting into the vision of a democratically centered foreign policy? And I think you've got some experience of this, haven't you? Yeah. Well, congratulations to the questioner for being in what is undoubtedly a growth industry. Um, the, the, um, I, I, I've been doing some, some work with the th think tank that I'm affiliated with, CSIS, on, on digital authoritarianism um, and looking at the ways in which um, the use of digital tools um, for the internet, for control, for surveillance, for uh, digital ID um, are being used and in many cases abused um, to control populations and to interfere um, in, in democratic areas. And some of this is in the fields of, of disinformation where I think that there's an enormous amount of work to be done. There was a fascinating hearing yesterday in the US with CEOs of Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, um, all talking about these issues and how these platforms that increasingly control information and commerce need to be dealt with in order to create uh, a, a fair but also uh, validly uh, true information superhighway that, that, that all of us are plugging into, and that's critically important. But at the same time, also coming up with ways uh, in which citizens around the world, these people we were just talking about, um, I mean, they are facing very rapid change and regimes with an enormous amount to invest in very dangerous technologies. Um, you look at what people are doing, whether it's on the streets of Portland or Hong Kong uh, or in Chile to protect their identities when they go to protests. Um, to make sure that their phones aren't geo-tracking them and that the regimes can then hack into that. Um, and of course, to make sure that there's not just uh, the hijacking of the platforms like what we saw last week with Twitter in ways that could potentially start a war. Um, uh, fortunately, it was just idiots trying to steal people's money. Uh, but you imagine what would happen if uh, if somebody hacked Donald Trump's account and said that there's an imminent attack on this place or that place. Um, so it's going to be enormously important in this environment uh, to protect basic rights and, and the, the, the flow of free uh, but also verifiably true information. Yeah, well, we come back again to that whole question about how can you trust the information that you're getting and from where is it coming? Another interesting question, um, you obviously, we've talked a lot about the kind of the, uh, the downward trend in uh, democracy, but one of our, um, one of our um, participants wants to know if you've got any positive examples where things are actually getting better. Give us some good news. 
I mean, there, there really is a, a, a good news out there for sure. And, and it would be a crime not to talk about it, particularly given how uh, hard so many people on the ground have been working. Um, and they're, they're across the scale. Um, so I think um, if you look at uh, what has happened in Tunisia um, over the last several years, um, you know, I think many of us look at the so-called Arab Spring with great lament and depression, um, but there are some good stories coming out of that. Um, and the community online um, in the Arab world uh, demanding democracy and pushing for reform um, remains a powerful one and, and a group of risk takers. Tunisia has been one of the best examples over time, even as they have struggled with issues like uh, extremism, um, but that's a positive one. Um, obviously, what happened in Sudan in the last couple of years is, you know, those moments are enormously exciting. There are still the possibilities for, for big changes um, when societies that have been long repressed um, move into um, a more positive direction. Um, and then you've got some of the, the slower stories. Um, you know, you look at um, some of the countries in East Asia, which have been a bit up and down, um, but overall as an aggregate block, some positive moves um, towards opening and democratic freedoms, um, which maybe while not profound on any given day, look over time um, like they may they, re they may really amount to long-term change. Um, and, and I just think it's also important to remember, you know, having worked on these fields, and I've done a lot of work in Afghanistan and Pakistan over the years, and, you know, we see these headlines of, of difficult places. When you go on the ground and you engage in civil society, or I was in Nigeria a bunch this year, there are so many people with very little who are struggling for the rights of their country, men and women, in profound ways. Um, and those are the people every day who you want to get up and support, no matter what the other macro trends are. First of all, because they're ultimately the ones who will carry the day, um, uh, but also because they deserve that support, because they're struggling for something that benefits us all. That's, that, that's a positive view and, and, and a good one to hear. Another question that we've had is about Latin America. And uh, our questioner is basically saying China and Russia are increasingly active there and it's not an area that the UK has an awful lot of influence in. Should we try and be active in those kind of areas as well as the ones that we've been more traditionally players in? I mean, I think probably because of the way that the, the questioner described it, there are probably uh, richer fields for the UK to till. Um, you, you know, I, I'm a strong believer that priority means, prioritization means you can't be everywhere doing everything. You have to pick the places where you think you can have influence and the issues where you can have influence. Um, I do think that, that the future of Latin America is incredibly important and certainly the UK should use its voice in international fora to make sure that they are supporting uh, actors and movements that are going to be carrying that burden. Um, but I do imagine that between the EU, Russia, uh, Middle East, North Africa, um, South Asia, particularly South Asia where the UK continues to have an enormous amount of support and things are, are really not trending in the right direction, um, those are probably the best places to, to focus. Interesting. Another question about, um, uh, which is a kind of uh, feeds into the discussion we were having about DFID and the Foreign Office, uh, and it's, um, it is, how would you link democratic development as an aid, a stroke support to trade deals? Um, would you see that as being a, a proposition that would work? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's funny that for so long people sort of separated these things because to me, what we one of the things critically that we've learned from globalization is, yes, trade is fundamental. It will be fundamental to all of our economic futures and to think otherwise, I think, is, is, is silly or a fantasy. But, but trade does not have to mean uh, that uh, that 
things are not operating in ways that seek to increase labor rights, that seek to reduce inequality, uh, that seek to make sure that taxation and things uh, uh, obscure but important things like transfer pricing and all of these things that allow kleptocrats to and, and corporations to hide wealth around the world instead of making sure that the citizens who deserve uh, those revenues are the ones that are actually benefiting from them. Those things should all be part of, of trade negotiations. Um, and it should be fundamental because, you know, the UK wants a fair playing field for its trade rules. They don't want to abide by workers' rights and unionization and taxation and all these things that I think strengthen the UK. Um, and dealing with countries that undermine all of these things just to create a, a cheaper uh, T-shirt or 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 you know um, bauxite or whatever people mine these days. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a question from Alex Folks, and it goes back to the issue of elections. And he says um, the UK government has indicated it is reviewing future participation in election observation um, organized by people like the OSCE. And that comes on top of the Brexit effect, meaning that any participation in EU missions for the UK is in doubt. Does Alex agree that election observation provides a cost-effective means of promoting democracy and holding regimes to their commitments, as well as boosting the UK's soft power? What's your view about that? Absolutely. I, I have been an election observer in a number of interesting places. I think it's an absolutely critical function. Uh, one of the great things that has happened with election observation in the last 10, 15, 20 years is that on the ground, domestic organizations, civil society organizations have gotten much better, much more sophisticated. They are also, I, I was talking probably a little too negatively about technology, you know, it's good or bad, depending on who uses it and how you use it. They've done great things to improve parallel vote tabulation and making sure that things are going well. And so first and foremost, we should be investing in domestic voting observation and empowering citizens to make sure that their own elections are free and fair. Uh, but I do believe that international election observation is still something that can be quite valuable um, I think bearing witness is always important. Um, and the ability, frankly, to say whether something went well. And, and I also believe that, that conditionality can be important. I mean, if we have partners who claim that they're going to do free and fair elections, sometimes even using support and resources from donor partners to do so, they have to commit to basic principles. And so part of the election observation is being there. But I also agree, I think, with an undercurrent of, of what the questioner said, which is that the UK shouldn't be doing this alone. It's so much stronger to have uh, observers from, from many nations there. I mean, it may be an appropriate moment for uh, an ambassador, a high commissioner, or someone else to step out in front. Um, but it's always good to have friends in these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an interesting question. Um, it comes from somebody who wants to remain anonymous, but it says, can democracy promotion and poverty alleviation go hand in hand? China is offering investments to many countries and supporting the governments to consolidate power. What can Western democracies do to support countries whose governments want Chinese investment, but their civil societies want more freedom and open societies? That's an interesting point. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think the first thing that's important is that this is not an either or. It, you know, it's not relegate China to the status of the Soviet Union and try to build walls, cut off relationships, and so on. It's not going to work in, in the modern world, and I, and I don't think it's good either for UK or for, for Chinese citizens. Um, I do think that it remains critically important to engage. But I want to speak to, I think, a troubling idea that is in some ways at the heart of what the questioner is asking. This idea that maybe authoritarianism is actually better for economic growth, that maybe authoritarianism is better for dealing with pandemics and big problems. Maybe it's better at poverty reduction. And, and I think that the resounding answer when you look at the aggregate of studies on this is no. Uh, 
Now, that's not to say that authoritarians can't sometimes do these things well, but over time, democracies do them better. Growth is better. Access to resources are better. Obviously, rights are better. Inclusion is better. Schooling is better. Uh, all of these things over the long term benefit citizens more when looking at these individual indicators than they do in authoritarian countries. And the other problem with authoritarian regimes is that they are brittle. They don't change. They don't allow free information. They don't acknowledge their mistakes honestly, which is why they ultimately often break down of their own accord. Uh, and what we need to make sure is that we are not investing in some idea or believing the idea that authoritarianism is just as good as democracy. Some authoritarians will get it better, some democracies will get things worse, but overall in the long term, it is really democracy that will provide the most success. And for my money, values that are fundamental to making sure that people are free um, is, is absolutely essential um, because that is something that is not only, I think, nice to have, but is a fundamental human right and needs to be at the core of the way that we think about development. To wrap up, final question for me. You've obviously spent a very long time looking at these issues and you've written, written this uh, very interesting report. Are you optimistic about the future, Alex, or are you pretty pessimistic as things currently stand? Um, you know, I, I, I think that the glass is a third full. <laughs> um, I, I mean, in many ways, I am a nature, but uh, by nature, an optimist in the sense that I always think that the positive change is possible, but that doesn't mean that it's probable or likely. Um, I think that we are at a juncture that we have not faced in a long time as a society where we actually have to make some very difficult decisions about our prospective futures. And for me, those are really about democracy and freedom, and they're about the planet and climate, and they're about fundamentally recognizing that equality, while a constant issue to perfect, is fundamental to who we are and what we believe in. And if we invest in those things, then I think the other problems that we face, we can, we can deal with. Um, but if we let those things slip, um, I fear that we will find ourselves um, in a place that we can't easily come back from. Um, and so I do see that there are a lot of negative trends at the moment. And in that sense, I am worried, I am concerned, more concerned than I have been ever in my life. Uh, but I also travel enough and meet enough people and talk to enough people to see that even in the hardest places and in the hardest moments, change is always possible. And it takes people to stand up for those things and to fight for them and to invest in them. Um, and I think it's time for the UK government to really look at itself and figure out how to get behind that uh, for its own future as well as for others. Thank you very much, Alex. That's been really interesting. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. So thank you again. And I'm going to hand back to Anthony. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you very much, Alex. That was a fantastic interview and set of questions from the audience. Alex's paper is called A Force for Good in the World, Placing Democratic Values at the Heart of the UK's International Strategy. The title draws on words that Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, uses quite often. And I think his sentiment that the UK should be a force for good in the world is widely shared across the country. And the question for the review that's taking place is how to translate that sentiment and that ambition into reality. And I think Alex's paper does a great job in showing how that can be done, what you need, right down to the nuts and bolts of a department within the new Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So thank you both very, very much for your time today. Thank you, audience, for joining us and for your questions. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.